I got here last year and we had a, a year of exploration. We looked at what we did, what we did well, what we did that could be better. We asked lots of questions and we did lots of observations. And we said, everything that we could possibly dream, like our school, can come true. We live in a country where Nikola Tesla was thought to be a bit of a nutcase. But now, many, many, many of his thoughts and dreams and ideas completely uphold the lives that we live. Wi-Fi, renewable energy, battery-powered cars and vehicles. Of his day, he was thought to be strange, of ideas that people just didn't get hold of. So everything that we can dream, your children can dream, can become real. I'm a Star Trek fan. I grew up in the 60s, 70s, watching Star Trek. And I was amazed at the things that they had. And now when you think about it, we all carry our personal communicator and science fiction became real. So things that we might think are completely impossible will become real in your child's life. Most of your kids will be doing work that doesn't even exist now. So we need to think about when we move our 52-year history from this building and this, the, the uh, villas that we were in, what do we want to build going forward from this year? What do we want to take with us into our new life? We've been 18 years in this little funky building, and now it's time to be an adult and step out of this and grow up and move into something contemporary and modern to enhance the education that we have. But what is it we want to do? So we got together a summit of the key stakeholders in our school. We got together students with teachers, teachers with parents, parents with the board, and we all sat around for one and a half days and talked about the school that we wanted. And we didn't really know what that school was. But we wanted to capture what was right in our world. The things we wanted to find the things that when we worked at our best, what did that look like? And what were the aspirations of all the stakeholders? So we met and we worked in groups, we collaborated, we shared ideas, we drew diagrams, we tested concepts, we changed them, we had a first iteration, a second iteration, we tried and tried and tried, lots of talking, lots of graphics, lots of listening. We did a lot of listening to students for them to tell us what they were looking for in a contemporary education. So in the end of it, it came up with a definition. We wanted to be a concept school of the future. And everybody, every group said, we want to be this. We want to be the concept school of the future. And then we said, okay, that's fantastic. What does it mean? And we went, oh, not sure. So then we had to explore what contemporary education looked like, what the world looked like for our students going into it. And we all felt a little, little bit like Kennedy saying, we are going to go to the moon. We're not really sure how we're going to do that, but we're going to go. And we will be the concept school of the future in Croatia and Zagreb. And some of the things we know how to do and some of the things we will find on our way. So when we decided what our concept school of the future was going to be, it all had to do with personalised learning, putting students in charge of their learning putting students in a position where they developed passions and internal motivation to do work. But it wasn't the teacher driving them or mums and dads after a hard day at work, do your homework, do your homework. But we were going to try and inspire your kids to be so motivated about their passion that they wanted to work and they wanted to do well. And we wanted to have a commitment to excellence. We were unashamedly wanting to be excellent at what we did, just everything. Sometimes we will be, sometimes we won't be, but we will try and we'll try and we'll try and we'll try and succeed because we want a commitment to excellence in everything we do. And we wanted a place that was joyful, that your kids actually enjoyed coming to. One of the measures that I'm asked about as I go around and do some consultancy is how do you measure the value and quality of the school? And one of the ways you can measure, and you can do this every day, is how fast do your kids want to run through the gate and how slowly do they want to leave? If you feel that these kids are rushing to school in the morning and dawdling on their way out, 
then they're probably connecting with the school in a positive way. So one of the things we did was we asked the students what sort of education they would want in a concept school of the future. Values as well as support for all aspects of learning. This can be achieved by establishing a better relationship between the teachers and students. <laughs> and having a healthy relationship between students and teachers can be achieved by having a more flexible schedule in school. We also believe that some activities, extracurricular activities like meditation, might improve this. We also want to give a voice and a place uh, to parents and students in order to give their opinion. And also, we as students, as much as teachers and uh, parents give uh, for, to us, we want to give back to them and to our local society. And, uh, and we just want to give back for everything everyone's done for us. Sometimes that might have been a little bit hard to hear. The students in their university school really had a passion to give back. They wanted to, they recognised what you do for them and what their teachers do for them, and they wanted to give back. They, when you listen to millennials speak, they want to contribute, they want to make a difference. So they wanted to be uh, establish a better relationship with their teachers so that they felt they knew their teachers better, that they were known better by their teachers. They wanted a more flexible schedule. So in the upper school, the middle school and the high school, we developed um, a passion time, time that expanded their schedule so that they could follow passions of their own. They wanted to feel supported in everything that they did. Students who were struggling wanted to feel that they were supported, that they were, their learning was enhanced by the interactions they had with their teachers and with their peers. But also the students who were doing exceptionally well didn't want to be left to do it on their own. They wanted also to feel support and be guided and that their learning was also facilitated. So we wanted to present learning that was supported in all aspects of learning. And the kids and the teachers together wanted a place that was safe and joyful and psychologically safe. We asked the board and the parents what they wanted. <laughs> Sounds like a strategic plan. <laughs> the innovative school of the future, with teaching methods, technology, and self-directed learning. As a crew of Starship ARSD, we believe our prime director <coughs> should be Innovative School of the Future. We believe this because it is aspirational, giving a clear vision for the future. We believe it's inspirational, giving motivation to all. And lastly, it is all-encompassing in everything that we do. Connect globally. Connect locally. Connect the self-directed learning. New technology. Personalized learning. Advanced learning methods. Innovative. Authentic learning. <laughs> so the parents and the board really wanted to, to take this idea of a concept school of the future and be aspirational. And that, that, that I whole idea of being a concept school of the future was going to be inspirational and be there in everything that we do. We wanted to have enhanced teaching methods. We wanted to use the latest technology where it was appropriate to do that. We wanted to um, allow our students to feel connected, not only connected with their, each other, with their peers, but to feel connected with their teachers, to feel connected with the city of Zagreb, to feel connected with Croatia, and to network outside of time zones and outside of the country in collaborations with other students through the internet and distance learning. So it was how to reach in and find the best of ourselves locally and how to connect uh, locally. We asked the faculty, and the faculty are very embarrassed that we're showing you this, we work, 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 the whole day through. We work, 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 guess what we like to do. Stop! We have a dream. 
So the administration and the leadership then got together and talked about what they wanted. And unfortunately, nobody took a video, and that's a shame. But there were uh, silly photographs, so I didn't get away completely. That's the Wizard of Oz, by the way, and being Australian, I can connect with that. So but what we were trying to do is, what is the point of school when Google knows everything? Because when you and I went to school, we would learn content, 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 content. We would do the exam and we'd feel good about the exam and two weeks later, a week later, we would have no clue what it was that we just studied. And we would go on summer holidays and go, what was that about? Well, something, because I got a mark for it. But it's not like that anymore for our kids. Google knows everything, so it's not about content. Content is important. I want you to hear that. Content is important, but it's not all there is. When Google knows everything, it's so easy to click a button and know so much more than I did 10 minutes, half an hour before. But what Google doesn't tell us very easily are the connections about the things we learn. What's happening today that if I analyse it in a certain way, I can see echoes of it in history. If I look at a certain culture and the way they move, Am I seeing parallels or challenging theories or complex ideas from the past or the future? We learn through experience. We don't leave 5,000 lives, but we can meet 5,000 characters in a lifetime through literature. So we learn through their experiences. Google doesn't give us that, so we have to think smarter about school. In the old days, schools thought very much about what the kids did at the end of school, did their grade 12, they got great exam results, and off they went. When we look at your students, your children, their rate of learning is going to be so fast that they have to be prepared for that. And we need to think about not this being the end point of school, but this where we are helping students be adaptable and creative and thoughtful and analytical in their thinking that allows them to have the transdisciplinary skills that, yes, they can access the IB diploma or the SAT or whatever exam system that they do, but it's more than that. They need to be ready for life. When you do your third year of university studying engineering, half of what you learned in the first year is redundant. So you have to be able to learn and unlearn, be able to change your mind, learn to set some ideas, set some theories, challenge them, build on them, take them apart, relearn them, because that's what the life is like for our students. So we want our graduates to be contributors. It was really important for our students to feel they were going to contribute to, to the world and continuously contribute to the world, and they realised that for them, the world is interconnected. 
It's not so much about borders. You can connect with all their friends and do all sorts of work interconnectedly, not even in the same country or the time zone. And they wanted to be compassionate and they wanted to contribute. So we were looking at students who wanted to be innovative world citizens who contribute to, to a better place. And that was something after the summit was really rich for both the adults and the students to be innovative, to be um, compassionate and to be uh, contributing to an interdependent world. So when we talk about change in a school, we're talking about a change of culture. And to reculture something is very, very difficult. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a journey. And we've started this journey. We started this journey with the summit when we asked the questions. We did some design work last year. And now we're launching it. And it's not going to be all done this year. It's going to take some time. Two, three, four years. And the board will build their strategic plan around the direction that we forged in the summit last March. But it will take time. It's a journey. And so it's all about changing the culture. And when you look at what the word culture means, and go back through um, French and back to Latin, it really means to nurture and to foster growth. And if that's not what a school is about, I don't know what it is. It's about cultures that foster growth and help students grow. So we've set about designing intentional cultures in our school. And we've just launched that this year. Hopefully you'll start hearing about it at home. But the intentional culture of being excellent, that every student, regardless of whether they've got ADD or whatever they've got, whether they're just brilliant in mathematics, that everybody can learn at a higher level. Everybody. We, we talked about this at length at the start of the year. We need to believe, and you need to believe, and kids need to believe, that they can learn at a higher level. Intelligence is not fixed. It can be grown. And we want our students to know how to go about using their learning muscles and grow their intelligence. So every student can learn at a high level. We also want it to be a, a school that had joy and compassion and care. So we wanted to offer the students a circle of extraordinary care. That they felt known and in touch and cared for by everybody in this school. That no student felt isolated. That every student had a connection with a significant adult at this school. Maybe it's not the class teacher, probably in the lower school it would be. Maybe it's the art teacher, maybe it's the music teacher. Maybe it's me, maybe it's Mr House. But every student deserves to feel known, understood and advocated for by the adults in this building. So we wanted to build a circle around our students of extraordinary care. Then we said, okay, if we don't believe anything is possible, we want our students to experience the unknown. Give them ideas, give them open-ended questions, let them follow their passions. Have a passion, this, work at it, work at it, work at it, work at it. Hang on, I've got a new passion. That's okay. Not to drop things and hop around, but to work at something, find it hard, but deliver your passions. A great three student doesn't know what his 18-year-old passion is. What our job is to do is give them that experience. <laughs> so we want our, every student to have dreams, to think big, to ask really big questions, and uh, hopefully you'll sit there and go, I don't know the answer to that question when they're asking questions at home, because that means they're thinking at a higher level. We can help you answer those questions by giving you questions to come back, and that'll be something we'll do later in the year. And then within that circle of culture, we want to look, okay, within the circle of culture and what our student was going to be as an international student, we wanted them to look at what it was we were actually going to have as a basis of our curriculum. And these three books um, are really, they're a good read. They're not very hard to read, they're not very technical, but they're excellent books. The first one, David Perkins, is uh, from Harvard University. And he talks about what's worth life-worthy learning now that Google knows everything. What is it, what's the learning of big scope that kids need? Is it doing logarithmic tables over and over and over again? Or is it understanding statistics and, and using real life math and applying it to, to situations? What are the transferability of the things that we learn? Yes, there's content for technical knowledge, but it's how this, this piece of technical knowledge go together to make life worthy learning really important. 
Then we said, okay, well, what skills do we want our kids to learn? And because they're going to be moving in and out of disciplines, they needed to be transdisciplinary skills. They needed to be the same sort of skills that they would use in mathematics, that they would use in social studies, that they would use in uh, English literature and language acquisition. So what are these transferable skills? And then we said, okay, if we're going to be powerful learners, what are we going to, how, what are the character traits of powerful learners? So we turned to Guy Claxton, a, a, a professor from um, the UK, who talks to students about their brain being another muscle. And it's a learning muscle. So like you go to the gym and you get better and fitter, the more you use your brain in ways of working, the more intelligent you become. Intelligence and IQ is not fixed. You're not just lucky or unlucky. It can be grown, it can be enhanced like any muscle of our body. So those three books, um, What's the Point of School by Guy Claxton, um, Most Likely to Succeed by Tony Wagner, he's the director of the uh, Harvard Institute of Innovation, and FutureWise from Tony, uh, David Perkins, also at Harvard. But then, what does that mean? So the concept learning is taking big ideas, challenging them, building new theories, testing the theories, having the theories break. In science, oftentimes it's, you can get a theory that works and works and works, and then it doesn't. As, and being able to understand what a misunderstanding is and being able to go back and find it. Being able to form these ideas, challenge those ideas, find something that makes it doesn't work, and then uh, have another iteration of the thinking. And then being able to test those evolving theories as we go along. And regardless of age level, these are all things that kids can do. You set it at a developmentally appropriate level, but the construct is the same, setting them difficult, challenging things to think about. Not just sit there and take what adults give us as the truth, because the truth will change tomorrow because we're discovering new things all the time. So when we looked at the competencies, Tony Wagner went around to all 500, Fortune 500 companies and said, if you've got masters of this and bachelors of science and this degree and that degree, why do the Fortune 500 companies always complain about the young graduates who go into the workforce not being able to work at a level that they're expecting. And it's common for the Fortune 500 companies to say, our graduates are underskilled. Yes, we know they're smart, but they're underskilled in the ways of working in the world. They're school smart, they're not work smart. And so he looked at what the, these skills were, and it was those seven, he called them the survival skills. No matter what business or life journey you're going on, you could be canoeing around Africa, you could be working a Fortune 500 company, you could be doing the leaf work, writing grants. No matter what you do, those skills are all going to come into play, regardless of the discipline within, your work, within which you're working. So then he distilled it further down and looked at the great innovators of now and in the past. And he found that they had greater levels of effective communication. They were very good at presenting arguments, either written or orally, but they had a capacity to listen. So sometimes we think in schools about reading and writing. Being able to listen and analyse is massively important. To be able, and that leads us to critical thinking. Being able to test the judgment, to be able to say, OK, well, how do I critically evaluate this piece of knowledge, this piece of um, this situation, and to be creative about finding solutions. And oftentimes, those solutions come from working with other people. It's important to be able to work on your own, but now more and more and more, the companies, the world of work, the world of how we live depends on um, high levels of collaboration. So those seven skills boil down to four um, skills for innovation, which will be explicit in uh, teaching your students and giving them the experiences to do. So they boil down like that. And oftentimes, critical thinking, creativity, problem solving, are things schools always say, and they've been saying them for years. But what does it actually mean, and how do you apply it? That's the thing that we're going to explore. How do we make that real? So then we looked at the character dis dispositions of great learners. And they had four, we call them the four R's, resilience, reflectiveness, reciprocity, and resourcefulness. 
But for your students, and I've asked the teachers, Mrs. House has worked with the teachers on doing this, we want your children to recognise these, not just be able to throw big words out, but to understand what having an obligation to myself and others is, understanding what latching on to work, being absolutely focused on that piece of work, what that is and what it looks like and how to recognise it. So being able, I won't read those, you can read them yourself, but those four R's are really the character traits of outstanding learners, and this comes from um, Guy Flaxton's work. And then we thought, okay, but we want a bigger picture. We're talking about interconnected worlds here. So then we went back and looked at what have societies experienced, regardless of time, regardless of place, regardless of race, regardless of location in the world, over history. In fact, what makes us human? If we're going to ask our students to go out and be innovative contributors to the world and mankind, what does it mean to be human? And when we looked at that, we found eight commonalities, and these are called eight, the eight human commonalities. All through history and time, people wanted to express themselves creatively. They wanted to depict beauty. They wanted to depict art. They wanted to be effective in their communications with each other. They wanted to be able to collaborate well in groups, to hunt, to fish, to live, to live in harmony. They wanted to be able to live a long life. And now we're getting longer and longer, longer lives. We should be healthy and happy in them. So how do we go about looking for healthy and happy lives? All through time, all through human evolution, people have tried to explain why they're here. There's an, ex there's an inherent expression of the spiritual. Maybe it's religious, but the, the spiritual. What does it mean to be me? We want students to understand and start this journey. You know, we've got a grade one student, we're not going to ask them the meaning of life. But we want them to explore and to think about what it is to be human and how to be balanced and how to live with meaning and purpose and how to be, and it's really important now, how to be responsible consumers and innovative uh, producers. How do we do those two things differently? Because there's an innate need in us to connect to the environment. And we're feeling that tension now as our environment breaks down. And these are the people, your kids, who are going to be in this world. In this world, those stresses and those stretches on our environment and our ability to consume and produce are really going to be tested. So, We'll do this by connecting the disciplines. And these are the disciplines that we would use in middle school and high school, but they're exactly the same disciplines and subject matter that you would see in the school. But we won't treat them as um, silos of knowledge. In the elementary school and the lower school, we want that connection piece. We want our students to explore these things and the interconnectedness of it. So we want our students to, do, to learn about design, which is why we brought coding in. It's, it's why we've enhanced our art offerings here. Um, to build in the arts program, to look at the sciences and humanities, individuals and societies, to learn another language. That's why we brought in Croatian um, for speakers of other languages. That's why we have our language program. We want them to explore language and literature, to find experiences outside themselves and to see if they can find balance and harmony in the stories that they're told. We want them to be confident users of the mathematical language and be able to test ideas and hypotheses and, and work out new ways of doing things. But ultimately, we want them to engage. We want them to engage in the passion of learning. We want them to engage in asking really big questions with no right answer. We want them to engage in finding passions and helping and being creative. But really, we want them to engage in life. And for a small child, life at school is a long time, so we want them to engage in school and we want them to have a, a fantastically rich experience. So that's the curriculum that we've rolled out after the summit that we'll be taking from this place to our new place next year. And we built it together in a curriculum model, which looks like this. So we have our student in the middle, and he can learn the characters and competencies, and he can do that in the language arts, he can do that 
and it all builds in to those commonalities, those human commonalities. And we're going to make 300 of these, and we're going to give them to all our kids from um, probably grade 1 to grade 12, and you'll have your own ASIZ learning ecosystem fidget spinner. So when they're sitting there, you can, you can play with that and say, okay, tell me about how being a strong character relates to some of the things you're doing in art. And we will send you after this, um, we'll put this on the website so you can look at it again, but we'll also send you a bank of questions that are rich, that are not what you, did you do this at school today? Because what's the answer to what did you do at school today? Nothing. Right? It was my answer, it's your kid's answer, and it'll probably be their kid's answer. It's not that it's a wrong answer, the question is wrong. And so some of the things we've designed is seesaw. Um, but if you want, you can choose not to do it, up to you. But if you want to be engaged in the child's learning, you can have a look on seesaw and say, tell me about that science machine that you built. You'll get a much better answer than what did you do at school today. And we'll give you about 20 question starters that will help conversations that are much better than what did you do at school today because the answer is nothing when we want your kids to be engaged and that's our purpose and our journey for the next four or five years. So thank you. I hope you enjoy your time in the classrooms this evening and Sandra and I are open for questions any time. Um, Don, Sandra and I will be walking around so if you want to stop us and challenge my thinking, ask me some questions, that's fine. So have a great evening. Thank you very much for your time.